Welcome to our witnesses who will address human rights and accountability or the serious lack of both in Sri Lanka. It's a privilege to join co-chair Jim McGovern uh, at this important hearing, especially during a time when we are focusing on human rights uh, across the globe. You know, back in June of 2018, I chaired a hearing on of my global human rights subcommittee called Human Rights Concerns in Sri Lanka. Our witnesses then looked at the state of accountability in the aftermath of the Sri Lankan civil war that ended in 2009. Sadly, as today's hearing will reveal, accountability concerns remain. That quarter of century long war was absolutely brutal with an estimated cost in blood of 100,000 lives and the displacement of hundreds of thousands more. It was largely fought along ethnic lines between the majority of Sinhalese and minority Tamils. Both sides, the Sri Lankan armed forces and the rebel Tamil Tigers were credibly accused of unimaginable war crimes. There were also religious dimensions to it as well, between largely Buddhist Sinhalese and Hindu Tamils. Through, though Christians are represented among both ethnic groups, as Christianity is said to date back to the time of St. Thomas the Apostle, who evangelized Sri Lanka and India. Sri Lanka is a religiously diverse country, also containing a Muslim community, though sadly, religious tensions often add to and compound the ethnic ones. Nowhere was this more tragically seen than in the Easter 2019 bombings of Christian churches by jihadist groups. Religious differences have also had political implications as well, as religious minorities have tended to support the current opposition with the governing party linked to Buddhist nationalism. All of this complicates the quest for justice and accountability. To this day, justice for many of the victims of the war remains elusive. I anticipate our witnesses will elaborate on the progress or lack of it on holding those responsible for war crimes uh, to account. A report from January of this year by the UN Human Rights Council unfortunately warns of, quote, deepening culture of impunity while ethno-nationalism rises. One of the concerns raised in our 2018 hearings, the Draconian Prevention of Terrorism Act, or PTA, remains unaddressed. If anything, the scope of the PTA has been expanded by additional troubling provisions promulgated in March of this year. After a brutal war that cost an unconscionable loss of life, the question begs the question, what can Congress do to better help Sri Lanka get on the right page again. And finally, uh, in early January of 2005, immediately after the December 26th Indian Ocean tsunami, I visited hard hit areas of Sri Lanka, along with Banda Aceh in Indonesia and Phuket in Thailand. The United States and much of the international community, along with Catholic Relief Services and other NGOs, quickly responded with life-saving humanitarian aid. Despite their staggering loss, and we had so many conversations with people who lost uh, large numbers of their family, the people of Sri Lanka were committed to rebuilding, and it was inspiring. So I yield back, and uh, I thank you, and I hope Jim's on the line to, to join us now. Yeah, so I'm having computer problems, but I hey, just Jim. linked in with, uh, I just, I'm, I'm stealing Congressman Ross's computer temporarily. So uh, so let me let me just say thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Co-Chair Smith, and let me uh, say good afternoon and welcome to everybody to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission hearing on, hum on the human rights situation in Sri Lanka. And, and um, you know, we'll introduce the distinguished witnesses shortly, but I want to thank them now for taking the time to share their expertise with us today. Two of our witnesses are connecting from Sri Lanka, where it's currently 2 a.m. in the morning, and we very much appreciate their willingness to join us when they ought to be enjoying a good night's sleep. And I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Deborah Ross. Uh, of North Carolina in particular. She's a member of the Human Rights Commission with whom we've worked closely on this hearing. It's a pleasure to share the virtual dais with her this afternoon. Uh, this week, the Biden administration has invited the governments of dozens of countries around the world to participate in a summit on democracy. The summit is organized around three themes, curbing authoritarianism, countering corruption, and safeguarding human rights. Sri Lanka was not on the invitation list. It's likely that the issues we will discuss today had something to do with that decision. The first of those issues is the backtracking on commitments to ensure accountability for the grave human rights violations and war crimes that occurred during Sri Lanka's 26 years of civil war. Those commitments were laid out in a 2015 UN Human Rights Council resolution 
that was co-sponsored by Sh Sri Lanka and widely seen as a positive step forward. They included establishing a truth commission, an office to search for missing persons and an office for reparations and the repeal of the Prevention of the Terrorism Act, among other things. Underlying these concrete commitments was a recognition that accountability is essential to uphold the rule of law and to make sure that grave abuses would not occur again. Unfortunately, not only has that promise of the 2015 resolution not been fulfilled, but the current government is proactively rolling back progress, as the UN documented in this report last January. The naming of military officials implicated in attacks on civilians to high positions and the pardon of staff of, of a staff sergeant who slit the throats of children pretty clearly signals the government's position. Twelve years after the end of the armed conflict, impunity for grave human rights violations and abuses is more entrenched than ever. The second issue we'll hear about today is the recurring violence and deepening discrimination against Sri Lanka's Muslim community. Attacks against Muslims in Sri Lanka are not new, but since the end of the Civil War, they have become more systematic. The state has not only failed to protect the community from mob violence, but is behind policies that explicitly discriminate, such as the forced cremation of Muslim victims of COVID-19 and proposals to ban veils in Muslim religious, in Muslim religious schools. Other religious minorities, including Christians, have also faced attack. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom has highlighted the use of, preventing terror, of, of the Preventing Terrorism Act to target Muslims and has warned about hate speech against religious minorities by Buddhist national groups. And a third issue is a shrinking space for civil society and dissent. In September, eight major human rights organizations denounced that Sri Lankan authorities were responding to protests with repression arbitrary arrests and intimidation against students, unions, teachers, and academics. The government has put in place emergency powers that allow it to detain people and conduct searches without warrants, seize property, and issue orders that cannot be challenged in court. These three interrelated issues don't exhaust the human rights and democracy problems in Sri Lanka. We're also seeing the use of democratic procedures to strengthen the executive at the expense of, uh, of the legislature and judiciary while concentrating power in the hands of a single family akin to Ortega's strategy in Nicaragua. So here's the thing, Sri Lanka is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious country. That's the reality. Either the, either the state figures out how to protect the rights of all its people, whatever their identity, or the future will be a repeat of the past, driven by violent inter-ethnic violence. And we should all wanna do all we can to prevent that. In my view, the U.S. government and Congress have generally been on the right side of these issues in Sri Lanka. We've recognized that the only route to stability is through reconciliation and peace and with full respect for human rights for all. Many of us uh, not too long ago wrote to Secretary Blinken, thanking him for co-sponsoring the newest Human Rights Council resolution that passed last March and to urge the administration to continue to prioritize accountability and institutional reform. And I think the decision to exclude Sri Lanka from the summit for democracy is consistent with that prioritization. That said, it's clear that things are not going in the right direction. Fear of China could lead some U.S. policymakers to give Sri the Sri Lankan government a pass, but we certainly will not. Uh, and I believe that would be a costly mistake. So I welcome the witnesses today, uh, and uh, I will. I, I, Mr. Smith, is over your mic. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Congresswoman Ross, um, who is responsible for this hearing. And so she's going to take this chair and I'm going to get out of her computer space. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Chair McGovern and Chair Smith um, for um, for holding this hearing and also working with my office to organize it. For as long as I've been in elective office and even before that, I've been hearing from Tamil constituents, many of whom fled Sri Lanka due to ethnic violence about ongoing human rights violations in that country. It's a privilege to be here to discuss these matters and to have the opportunity to learn from the expert witnesses we will have today. The 26 year civil war in Sri Lanka officially concluded on May 18th, 2009. This conflict was marked by egregious human rights abuses from both sides. The Liberation Tigers of Tamil Alam LTTE reportedly used civilians as human shields. The government forces have been accused of attacking civilians in safe zones, as well as murdering, 
torturing and disappearing government critics and LTTE supporters. These violations, particularly those committed by government forces, were not adequately addressed by the international community. After the war ended, the UN Secretary General established a panel of experts on accountability in Sri Lanka, which found that some UN agencies and individuals had failed in their mandates to protect civilians, had underreported government violations, and had suppressed reporting efforts by their field staff. The panel concluded that the UN did not adequately invoke principles of human rights that are the foundation of the UN, but appeared instead to do what was necessary to avoid confrontation with the government. Former President Obama wrote in his memoir, A Promised Land, that consensus among the five permanent members of the UN Security Council can be difficult to find which ultimately hamstrings the UN's ability to act. He wrote, member states lacked either the means or the collective will to reconstruct failing states like Somalia or prevent the ethnic slaughter in places like Sri Lanka. Unfortunately, the end of the civil war did not end human rights abuses in Sri Lanka. Following the 2019 Easter bombings, which killed over 250 people in Sri Lanka, Gotobaya Rajapaksa ran for president on a platform of national security and tackling terrorism. However, his, administrat his administration's anti-terrorism measures rely on oppressive and authoritarian tactics, marginalizing the Tamils and Muslim minorities in Sri Lanka. The Prevention of Terrorism Act in particular facilitates the arbitrary detention and torture of ethnic and religious minorities. The Rajapaksa administration has also turned a blind eye to past abuses, elevating individuals implicated in war crimes to senior governmental positions and even going so far as to pardon a convicted war criminal who was found guilty of slitting the throats of eight Tamil civilians, including a five-year-old child. It's heartening that the international community has begun to take stronger, a stronger stance against human rights violations in Sri Lanka than it did during the Civil War. In January of this year, the UN Office of the High Commissioner released a report describing the disturbing trends in Sri Lanka these trends include the militarization of government functions, ethno-nationalist rhetoric, intimidation of civil society, at all of which can set, send the nation on a path toward a recurrence of widespread human rights violations. Upon releasing this report, um, Michelle Bachelet said, to the, she's the high commissioner, given the demonstrated inability and unwillingness of the government, to advance accountability on the national level, it is time for international action to ensure justice for international crimes. In March of 2021, the UN Human Rights Council passed a resolution aimed at uncovering human rights abuses during Sri Lankan civil war. Notably, the resolution enables the Office of the High Commissioner to collect, consolidate, analyze, and preserve information and evidence related to violations of international and human rights law. I'm hopeful that this step at the UN is the beginning of renewed international effort to promote peace, justice, and accountability in Sri Lanka, and to prevent a recurrence of ethnic violence. Thank you, and I yield back. Um, so, um, Mr. McGovern has asked me to introduce the panel. And so I will say who the panel is and then um, ask you to um, testify in the order in which I call you. And I'll remind you if, you, um, if you're one of the, the later people to, um, to testify. The first person to testify is Ambika Sakayunathan. I hope I said that right. And please correct me if I'm wrong. She's a human rights lawyer based in Sri Lanka and a fellow of the Open Society Foundation. 
from October 2015 to March 2020. She was a commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka, where she led the first ever national study of prisons. Her report on drug control, detention, and rehabilitation in Sri Lanka, the first stu such study, was published in August 2021 by Harm Reduction International. She's a member of the of an expert panel of Trial Watch and the Clooney Foundation, and a member of the network of experts of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Um, I'm going to just say the names of the next people, and then um, after the first witness, I'll share their bios. So after that, we'll have Sandra Anton, um, JD candidate at Harvard Law School, where she's co-president of Advocates for Human Rights. Um, then Shireen Sorori. Then we will have um, Neil Devata. Then we will have Carolyn Nash, and then we will have John Sipton. So, um, Ambika, um, please, please uh, start and share with us. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Co-Chair McGovern, Co-Chair Smith, and um, uh, Congresswoman Ross and honorable members of the commission. Thank you for inviting me to testify at this hearing. Successive Sri Lankan governments, uh, including the government that came to power in 2015, failed to deal with accountability for human rights violations, thereby entrenching impunity. For instance, police brutality and torture are systemic in Sri Lanka. The reluctance of successive governments to address wartime violations can be attributed to their fear of losing their support base and being seen as too accommodating of the demands of non-majority communities. Due to this, they refuse to acknowledge and address the na majoritarian nature of the Sri Lankan state, which is driven by Sinhala Buddhist nationalism and normalizes the discrimination of other ethnic communities. Impunity, hence, has become the permanent normal in Sri Lanka. The current government, which has authoritarian tendencies and shows contempt for the rule of law, makes no effort to even pretend to adopt an inclusive approach to public policymaking and governance. Instead, it reaffirms the majoritarian nature of the state at the macro and micro levels at every opportunity. Sinhala Buddhist nationalism and militarization are the two pillars of the president's ideology that drive his decision-making and action. The politics of hate fueled by Sinhala Buddhist nationalism targets Tamils and Muslims who are subject to ethno-religious profiling of different forms, giving rise to discrimination and marginalization. All this is aided by a historically unchecked national security regime, which has been rapidly expanding since November 2019. For example, Sinhala Buddhist nationalism and militarization converge in the takeover of land in the north and east by the archaeological department in the guise of reclaiming Buddhist sites, often aided by the military. In this instance, the law is instrumentalized to effect demographic change that adversely impacts Tamils and Muslims. The regime's understanding of governance is feudal and patronage-driven, and bullying is a common strategy used to deal with states that call for accountability for rights violations. The regime will use interstate rivalry, such as that with China, but it also craves the validation of the West, which has been amply illustrated. Any action the regime has taken, however minimal, is due to pressure and not praise. Examples are the UN Human Rights Council resolution and the European Union's GSP plus trade privileges. While wartime accountability, for, while accountability for wartime violations is integral to the Tamil community, impunity for wartime violations needs to be viewed within the broader context of the absence of accountability generally, where elected and appointed public officials break and abuse the law with impunity. Although the government makes promises to advance accountability, its actions illustrate the disingenuous nature of these promises. Civic space is shrinking and rights activists, journalists and dissenters all over the country are at risk of state reprisals. The North and the East are occupied by the military and civil society, families of the disappeared, human rights defenders 
journalists who report on militarization and issues such as state appropriation of private land in Tamil majority areas and former combatants are subject to surveillance threats and intimidation. Due to the war on drugs, we note extrajudicial killings as well as a large number of arrests and imprisonment of persons who use drugs. Compulsory drug rehabilitation, which violates human rights standards, and it's contrary to the UN common position on drugs and the UN joint statements on compulsory drug rehabilitation is still legal in Sri Lanka. People detained in drug treatment centers, some of which are managed by the Sri Lankan army, suffer physical and psychological violence, inhuman conditions of detention and lack of evidence-based treatment. The Prevention of Terrorism Act continues to be weaponized against Tamils, Muslims and dissenters. The most recent example is the de-radicalization from holding violent extremist religious ideology regulations issued under the PTA in March 2021. This creates a new predictive style of offense based on a broad legal definition that enables the arrest and detention of citizens contrary to the procedure set out by Sri Lankan law and also international human rights standards. The regulations allow investigations to commence after an arrest, uh, after an arrest, thereby depriving persons of knowledge of the reason for their arrest. The subjective determination of what is deemed an offence risks the decision being influenced by personal prejudice and unconscious bias. The regulations also violate the right to a fair trial because they allow a person to be deemed guilty and sent to rehabilitation for up to two years without trial, a decision that is made solely on the recommendation of Sri Lanka's Attorney General. There is no mention of the criteria by which the decision to send a person to rehabilitation is made, nor is there information on the con contents of the rehabilitation program. Recommendations to the US government is that the support to the government of Sri Lanka should not be unconditional. It should always adhere to the principle of do no harm and be in alignment with the UN Human Rights Council Resolution 46-1. To support the pursuit of accountability by victims through multiple means, including universal jurisdiction, the Magnitsky Act, and public designation measures via Section 7031C of the Department of State Foreign Operations and Related Programs Appropriation Act. Actively support both via public pronouncement and other means vulnerable populations such as human rights defenders. And finally, support a political solution that addresses the root causes of the ethnic conflict. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony and for the poignancy of your testimony. Um, the next person to testify is Sandra Anton. She's a JD candidate at Harvard Law School, where she's co-president of Advocates for Human Rights and a student attorney in the International Human Rights Clinic. She specializes in the field of international human rights law, international criminal law, with a focus on justice and accountability for victims of mass atrocities. For the past year and a half, Ms. Anton has led a project team within the International Human Rights Clinic that works with a wide network of partners seeking accountability for violations of international law committed against the Sri Lankan Tamil community during the country's civil war. Ms. Anton's father is Tamil and was forcibly displaced. Ms. Anton, you have the floor. Ms. Anton, are you muted? Are you with us? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Chairman McGovern, Chairman Smith, Congresswoman Ross, and esteemed members of the, Tam of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission for the opportunity to testify today. Today, my remarks will center on international justice efforts to hold the Sri Lankan state security forces accountable for mass atrocity crimes. I will also identify how the United States can bolster these accountability efforts, particularly for violations committed against the Tamil civilian population, 
that occurred during the final stages of the country's internal armed conflict in 2009. Finally, I would like to center the importance of having survivor communities in these accountability efforts. In addition to being Tamil, I also am the, am the descendant of an Ashkenazi Jewish mother whose relatives escaped Jewish pogroms in Eastern Europe. Indeed, I am the product of two lineages of survivors that at different periods in history sought refuge and relief in the United States to escape this relentless ethnic persecution and violence. With that in mind, in the context of today's hearing, I want to emphasize how important it is that the United States support work by Tamils for Tamils. I will ask that my written testimony today is submitted for the record. What happened in Sri Lanka in 2009 and the complete impunity to date that has remained for these crimes in the nearly 13 years since marks one of the worst failures to uphold the promise of never again in modern history. Much of the bloodshed during this time occurred in government established no fire zones, where at one point over 300,000 Tamil civilians were trapped between the warring parties, a situation that a 2011 UN panel of experts has described as reminiscent of hell. Tens of thousands of these civilian, of these civilians died in the war's final eight months alone, a staggering death toll that came primarily as a result of military shelling. The past 12 years in Sri Lanka have shown that domestic-led accountability efforts at this point in time are simply not an option. The unwillingness and inability of successive Sri Lankan governments to acknowledge, let alone independently investigate and prosecute those responsible for human rights abuses committed against the Tamil community in 2009 is clear. The return to power of the Rajapaksa family has only reaffirmed that impunity persists. The uncertain terms, sorry, the failure of Sri Lankan institutions to investigate and prosecute has been recognized in no uncertain terms by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in her most recent report in January 2021 on Sri Lanka. For this reason, international accountability efforts must step in to fill the gap and pursue the prosecution of war crimes and crimes against humanity for the 2009 era violations. The US government has a critical role to play here in bringing high profile, high level prof, uh, perpetrators to justice in both international and domestic forums outside of Sri Lanka. The US government should first support support the collection, verification, analysis, and sharing of evidence, including survivor testimony. In March 2021, the UN Human Rights Council resolution on Sri Lanka recognized, quote, the importance of preserving and analyzing evidence and decided to strengthen in this regard the capacity of the Office of the High Commissioner to collect, consolidate, analyze, and preserve information and evidence. The US government should fully support this call to expand independent investigative efforts as it has supported similar efforts in Syria or Myanmar to collect and preserve evidence. The Human Rights Council also called on governments to support, to quote, support relevant judicial and other proceedings, including in member states with competent jurisdiction. With this in mind, US government agencies should coordinate and facilitate information sharing and cooperation 
with foreign officials' investigations and prosecutions of war crimes under their domestic universal jurisdiction frameworks. And finally, there should be dedicated support for Tamil survivor communities to center them in accountability efforts. As those with the most at stake in terms of this period in time, survivor communities have relevant experiences, evidence, and expertise that must be integrated into a holistic approach to achieving accountability and justice. Overall, the United States and the international community cannot undo what happened in 2009, but we can make sure that calls for justice from victims do not go, un do not go ignored. Thank you for your time today. And I would also just like to clarify uh, my, even though my father had uh, escaped Sri Lanka and ethnic persecution there, he was not forcibly displaced, uh, but instead was one of the lucky ones to get to leave on his own. Well, thank you so much for your testimony, your leadership, and for clarifying the record. Uh, the next person to testify is Sri Saruru, a co-founder of the Women's Action Network, uh, a collective of nine women's groups that works on advancing women's rights, research and documentation and promoting women's engagement in legal reforms while improving access to justice through legal aid, provision of shelter, livelihood assistance, awareness raising at all in the north and east of Sri Lanka. She is an Ashaka Fellow and was awarded the Franco-German Prize for Human Rights and the Rule of Law in 2017 and the United, State, United Nations Development Program's End Peace Award. She writes about access to justice and minority rights in the media and her peace building work brings together Muslim and Tamil women. The floor is yours. Thank, good evening, everybody. Good morning to my colleagues uh, from Sri Lanka. Um, thank you very much for uh, putting together this event. It's very timely, particularly in relation to forthcoming March Geneva session. And the US at last wonderfully stepping in to co-share the res you know, resolution uh, on Sri Lanka. Um, and thank you very much, uh, uh, co-chair McGovern and Chris Bith and Congresswoman Ross for your interest uh, in Sri Lanka. And thank you very much for everybody who has worked hard on this effort. Um, let me talk about the current trend and the current issues that we are faced with. And uh, the, vil the vilification of ethnic minority groups during Sri Lanka's armed conflict has continued into a post-war setting with the added dimension of ethno-religious minorities now becoming targets. A culture of impunity during and the and after the war ensures that perpetrators of violence escape accountability, like my other colleagues talked about. Unsettled human rights issues stemming from the conflict, such as arbitrary arrest and detention and the prevention of terrorism, as Ambika talked about, and custodial torture have continued rampant, un, rampant under successive governments and contribute to a continuum of violence faced by minorities at present. In addition to PTA that many spoke about, the International Convention of Civil and Political Rights Act has been weaponized to target the very minorities it was enacted to protect. We have witnessed multiple episodes of mass scale violence and campaign of hatred targeting religious minorities, particularly Muslims. Since the end of the war in 2009, violent rhetoric was un unleashed against Halal certification, the attire of Muslim women, Muslim houses, businesses, properties, places of worship, and Muslim religious educations. These episodes were primarily led by organizations and alliances of ethno-religious nationalists seeking to establish Sri Lanka as an exclusive homeland of singular Buddhists. Led by hardline Buddhist monks, 
these ethno-nationalist groups have captured the imagination of the Sinhala Buddhist majority, particularly the youth, and have engaged in hate mongering and mass scale events of physical violence and property damage, triggering states, emergen states of emergency. With the election of new president in 2009, targeted structural discrimination, marginalization, and violence against minorities have become commonplace. While in the past, non-state actors have received implicit support from the state when perpetuating violence against religious minorities, the current administration has engaged in deliberate structural discrimination, including through the adoption of official laws and policies designed to marginalize religious minorities. For instance, the government's 2020 mandatory cremation policy saw, saw the forced cremation of over 300 Muslims who died or were suspected to have died of COVID. Although the forcible cremation policy was reversed in a limited manner due to heightened international pr pressure including UNHCR, OIC, and special mandate holders, the discrimination and manifestation of hate persist. To date, the burial of those who died of COVID are permitted only in one designated burial ground, nearly 300 kilometers away from capital, that too under a careful watch of the military, and severe restriction in terms of family members' particip family members participation and rituals. Minority religious places of worship and charitable organization, religious related ch charitable organization have been subject to increasing surveillance. This trend was observed following the Easter attack in 2019 and increased further since the pandemic. Law enforcement and intelligent office officials have visited several churches across the country asking for information such as the name and the contact details of pastors, church committee members, congregants, financial details, their registration with any state institution, while Muslims are questioned by intelligent officials for dis distributing sakat fund, a religious obligation for Muslims to charitable organization. The state seems to view zakat donation as contribution to radicalize and mobilize Islamists. Most recent development with regard to structural persecution of Muslims were the proposed ban on burqa, to which cabinet ministers have granted approval, and the de-radicalization regulation Ambika mentioned. I feel this regulation, if passed, will further strengthen the controversial PTA. The appointment of the new presidential task force for one country, one law, chaired by Nyanasar, a rabbit monk, who heads Bodhu Balasena, translated Buddhist militant force, who has been behind many violent mob attacks in Sri Lanka, is yet another, another hurdle to full realization of rights of religious minorities in Sri Lanka. The concept of one country, one law was hypocritical from its inception, especially in light of the impunity with which the powerful individuals, including figures such as Dhanasar himself, continue to operate. His appointment to chair a task force that is claimed to ensure the equal treatment and status of all citizens call into serious question of the government and its policies. The appointment of this task force and the presidential task force on Eastern archaeological and heritage, which Ambika referred to, are an abuse of executive power and has been viewed by many as overt attempt by the president to establish an exclusive single Buddhist uh, nation. Um, I would uh, ask uh, US to pay close attention to the accountability pillar uh, as what well, you know as part of uh, the Human Rights Council um, and, and, and the evidence gathering part of it. Uh, there is lack of resources with regard to evidence gathering processes, and I hope there will be enough resources put into this process because what we are witnessing currently is because of the failure of holding Rajapaksha's accountable for war crime committed then. And also, please carefully pay, uh, you know, analyze the militarization and also the Buddhism turned violent because many of the counter-terrorism -terror programs, uh, which uh, was called as 
a countering extreme violence is targeting only a particular faith in Sri Lanka. It also comes with the connotation of how West see uh, basically policies of anti-terror laws are being created. Sri Lankan Buddhism has been violent. It need to be carefully analyzed and Sri Lankan government currently is reforming PTA, which is highly problematic because uh, with this government, we don't expect much to come. We won't, we feel that PTA will be hardened further. Uh, the, as a community, suffered community, uh, they won't, I mean, many of the people that I have worked with wanted P PTA to be repealed. Sri Lanka has enough laws to look after terrorism if needed. And then Sri Lankan government is also doing constitutional reform since they have two third majority and already 13th amendment to the constitution that 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 only gave little bit of a power devolution is also uh, watered down so us paying close attention to constitutional reform is also very important thank you very much i'm here to answer the questions thank you so much for your testimony um next we have neil devata um he's a professor in politics and international affairs at wake forest university in north carolina his research interests include Asian security and politics, ethno-religious nationalism, ethnic conflict uh, resolution, and democratic transition and consolidation. He's the author of Blowback, Linguistic Nationalism, Institutional Decay, and Ethnic Con Conflict in Sri Lanka, and numerous articles. He has consulted for a number of organizations, including the U United States Agency for International Development, Freedom House, and the Global Center for Pluralism. Welcome, Pro Professor. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Ross. Uh, thank you, Co-Chair McGovern and uh, Co-Chair Smith. Um, I'm uh, very happy to testify at this uh, important hearing. Um, as has been noted, uh, despite the civil war in Sri Lanka ending in 2009, uh, the island has failed to pursue genuine reconciliation with the Tamil minority and accountability for alleged human rights violations. This even as nationalists with links to government figures whipping up Islamophobia to periodically attack the country's Muslims. Both the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam and Sri Lanka's military forces committed war crimes throughout the war. And this was especially the case, as has been noted, during the last six months of the conflict. But with nearly all LTTE leaders dead, many killed after they surrendered to government forces, the onus is on the Sri Lankan state. But with many among the country's leading politicians and military personnel accused of having committed war crimes, securing even a modicum of accountability has been difficult. The fact is that there is also no support for accountability among especially the majority Sinhalese community. Wars lead to atrocities and they brutalize people and societies. Sri Lanka's war was no different, but countries that have engaged in ethnic conflicts are likely to experience further conflicts unless reconciliation and some degree of accountability are pursued. Sri Lanka has failed on both counts. What is disturbing, as has been noted here, is how the governments of Mahinda Rajapaksa and Gotabe Rajapaksa seem to prefer fanning ethno-religious tension over reconciliation even as they cavalierly disregard any need for accountability. The lessons learned and reconciliation commission put together after the war ended noted that, I quote, the root cause of the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka lies in the failure of successive governments to address the genuine grievances of the Tamil people, end of quote. The war multiplied those grievances. Yet rather than trying to accommodate legitimate, legitimate Tamil complaints, Rajapaksa governments have sought to suppress and humiliate the community. Indeed, it often seems like governments under the Rajapaksas are pursuing a schadenfreude nationalism, whereby they and their majoritarian advocates take glee in seeing Tamils being humiliated. 
why else prevent Tamils from singing the national anthem in the Tamil language? A privilege they enjoyed for years and was reinstituted under the previous government. Why harass and prevent Tamils seeking to remember those who died during the ethnic conflict, whether they were associated with the LTT or not? And this while the government builds massive monuments to honor soldiers who perished in the conflict. And despite Tamils commemorating their dead peacefully between 2015 and 2019 under the previous government, why not return Tamil lands taken over during the conflict instead of using them to further militarization and Tamil dependence and insecurity? As uh, Shreen Saru noted, this Shardam Friday was also evident when Muslims were forced to cremate relatives who died from COVID-19. And this despite the World Health Organization and others reiterating that burying coronavirus victims posed no dangers that the government reversed course in February when it wanted predominantly Muslim countries in the United Nations Human Rights Council to oppose a resolution against it, proved that the practice was hardly health related. These are merely some issues pertaining to reconciliation and they are so easily dealt with when compared to the demands related to accountability. The post war years make one thing clear. The Sri Lankan state is not committed to pursuing accountability for the alleged war crimes committed against Tamils. The goal seems to be to silence those within Sri Lanka who demand justice and string along the international community into the distant future. Sri Lankans from all communities have experienced human rights abuses, especially over the past 50 years. Few represent the, representing the state have been charged for perpetrating crimes against them. This absence of accountability that extends to corruption among high ranking officials has led to a culture of impunity that reached new levels with the violence that was committed against Tamils. And the present government, as both Representative McGovern and Ross noted, has exacerbated this culture of impunity by appointing serving and retired military personnel accused of war crimes to high positions and pardoning individuals like the army sergeant who was sentenced to death for slitting the throats of eight Tamils, including four children. This culture of impunity is directly related to the absence of accountability. Thus, the quest for accountability is important, not merely because it is related to crimes against Tamils, but because securing some sort of accountability could prevent such crimes against all communities being repeated. It is also clear that only international pressure moves the government on human rights. For instance, the government only now discusses amending the PTA because the EU parliament has cited the PTA and threatened to yank away the GSP plus privilege Sri Lanka depends on. The PTA was designed to target Tamils. Following the 2019 Easter Sunday attacks, it also targeted Muslims remotely related to the suicide bombers. None should be surprised if going forward, it will be used to target Sinhalese now protesting the regime. The international community should continue to pressure Sri Lanka to get rid of draconian statutes like the PTA and pursue reconciliation and accountability. But this accountability should not be about seeking revenge. It should be about attaining closure. This understanding is especially important given the ground realities in Sri Lanka. The Tamil diaspora should also play a constructive role in putting pressure on Sri Lanka to account for war crimes committed against Tamils. But the diaspora also needs to acknowledge the atrocities the LTTE perpetrated in Sri Lanka. Tamils who continue to campaign for a separate state while ensconced abroad are no friends of Tamils living in the island. Reconciliation and accountability are absolutely necessary for all communities in Sri Lanka to move forward amidst imperfect pluralism and democracy. But any promotion of Tamil separatism makes that quest harder. Thank you. And I look forward to trying to answer any questions you may have.
Thank you very much, Professor. I look forward to meeting you in person, maybe sometime in North Carolina. I hope so. Yeah. Um, we have two more presenters, and then I do believe we will have some time for questions. I've heard that votes will not begin until closer to five, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to get some good interaction. Um, our next presenter is Carolyn Nash. She's the Asia Advocacy Director for Amnesty International USA. Prior to joining Amnesty, Ms. Nash lived for six years in Myanmar, where she managed human rights and governance programs for TROCARE and authored um, at uh, youth, well, hashtag youth waging peace, a guide to youth led prevention of violent extremism published by UNESCO. She has also lived in and done human rights programming in Indonesia, East Timor, Kenya, and Uganda. She holds an MA in International Relations and Economics from John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Welcome, Ms. Nash. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congresswoman Ross, and thank you to the co-chairs McGovern and Smith and members of the commission for the opportunity to speak with you today. The human rights situation in Sri Lanka is grim and it's gotten worse over the past two years. The government would like you to believe that there are sufficient mechanisms in place to deal with human rights violations. This is simply not the case. Security forces have enjoyed decades of impunity for war crimes and other crimes against humanity. In 2015 to 2019, the prior government took limited steps to improve accountability, including setting up the Office on Missing Persons and the Office of Reparations. But since the government took, the current government took control in 2019, these institutions have been intentionally undermined. The current government is unwilling to provide accountability on its own, and this makes international pressure and US leadership critical. Violence towards minorities continues to plague the country. The Muslim community has suffered boycotts of their businesses, forced evictions, physical violence. Mobs have attacked their homes, their places of worship, and their businesses. In each of these incidents, the state has failed to protect the Muslim community, to hold perpetrators to account, and to ensure justice for victims. But this is more than a failure to respond. It's a political strategy that pays dividends to those in power. In 2019, when suicide bombers from a local Islamist group carried out the Easter bombings, this was a, a, a coordinated attack on three churches and three hotels. More than 250 people were killed and over 500 injured. In the aftermath of that violence, there was a need for credible investigation, for justice, for accountability. Instead, anti-Muslim sentiment reached a fever pitch. Many politicians saw this as an opportunity to capitalize on the violence for their own personal and political gains. The Sri Lankan People's Party, the SLPP, used this moment of widespread xenophobia to garner the support of the, the majority Sinhalese Buddhist community and to encourage the extremist national groups in the country. This is a strategy that worked. The SLPP came to power on a promise of increased authoritarian leadership and public security. And because that strategy worked, it continues today. Muslims are targeted and scapegoated by the state to distract from other political and economic issues. President Rajapaksa was defense secretary during the Civil War and continues to face allegations of war crimes. He has every interest in directing his government to undermine domestic justice mechanisms in the country. Criminal charges against government loyalists are often dropped. Investigations are abandoned with no explanation. Mob violence against Muslims has been carried out sometimes in full view of security forces with no efforts at intervention or arrest. And while the government condones this ongoing violence towards the Muslim minority, it simultaneously tries to undermine accountability mechanisms for past violations committed towards the Tamil minority. Um, in March of last year, as has been mentioned, the president pardoned Sunil Ratnayaka, a sergeant who had been found guilty of the murder of eight Tamil civilians during the Civil War. His victims included three children, one of whom was a five-year-old boy whose body showed signs of, of torture. It took 13 years for Sri Lankan courts to deliver this conviction, and one day for the president to undo it. The domestic institutions in the country are broken by design, and the government has been unwilling to do anything about it. 
And towards that end, I'd like to encourage U.S. leadership in making a difference in the country. There are three strategies that I would suggest for this. The first is engagement on the Human Rights Council, where the U.S. has shown leadership in the past and can again. This includes making sure that evidence of war crimes is collected and preserved, and also working with council members to make sure that a strong follow-up resolution is adopted in September. The second is to work on the ground with civil society and human rights defenders and to ensure that the U.S. is sending embassy representatives to emblematic court hearings, including those of Hajaz Hezbollah, Anaf Jazim, and Priget Ekmaligoda. Finally, the U.S. should call on the Sri Lankan government to make the key legal reforms necessary to ensure that these institutions are credible and independent. This includes the repeal of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, but also an insistence on full transparency in critical offices, including the Office on Missing Persons and the Office on Reparations. In their current state, the domestic mechanisms are unable by design to provide the accountability that's necessary. But Sri Lanka is not immune to outside pressure, particularly in this moment where they continue to wrestle with the pandemic and are facing a severe financial crisis. There is scope here for the U.S. to intervene and to, to pressure to see an advancement of accountability, and I would certainly encourage you to do so. Thank you so much for your time, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony and your constructive suggestions. Um, finally, we have John Sifton to testify. He's the Asia Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch. He's previously served as a researcher and acting Deputy Washington Director. Mr. Sifton began working at Human Rights Watch in 2001, first as a researcher on Afghanistan and Pakistan, and then as a senior researcher on terrorism and counterterrorism. He founded a public interest investigation firm, One World Research which he directed from 2007 to 2010. He holds a law degree from New York University School of Law. Mr. Sifton, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, it's very difficult for me to follow all these distinguished panelists who have so aptly laid out the situation in, F, uh, in Sri Lanka and the recommendations for the U.S. government to deal with them. I've would like to submit for the record a written version of this testimony that goes into detail about a lot of these um, issues and which we've posted on our website at Human Rights Watch, if that's not a problem. Absolutely. Um, and in that, I go over many of the problems my distinguished co-panelists have already been through. I don't want to repeat them. The lack of impunity, uh, the failure to repeal problematic laws, the political motivated uh, prosecutions, the changes to the constitution. I think my panel, my fellow panelists have already dealt with all of these issues very eloquently. I wanna stress the uh, part of my testimony at the end, which is about what the US government can do about these problems, both the administration and Congress. So I'm gonna run through that right now. Um, our first recommendation is that U.S. government officials, both administration officials and members of Congress and staff, need to continually press the Sri Lankan government during CODELs, staff DELs, or in letters and interactions with the U.S. Uh, sorry, with the Sri Lanka Embassy in Washington about the importance of these issues, repealing, substantially amending the. Prevention of Terrorism Act, ending the harassment and intimidation of human rights defenders and other critics of the government. Uh, U.S. officials need to be urging Sri Lankan officials as often as possible um, on these issues. So those things, scrapping recommendations for the Commission on Political Victimization, all that just, they need to be hearing it on a constant uh, basis. But that also goes to the United States military which continues to engage uh, in interactions with the Sri Lankan military, especially with respect to its Navy. We strongly urge the Biden administration to use the military to military engagements to deliver these messages as well. And specifically, communicate that future engagements, enhanced engagements, increased engagements, 
not to mention military assistance, will be predicated on Sri Lanka improving its human rights record. And as uh, my colleague at Amnesty just mentioned, the United States absolutely needs to maintain its engagement on Sri Lanka resolutions at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Previous time I testified in the House uh, that uh, Mr. Smith referred to um, a few minutes back uh, was a time when the United States had just withdrawn, shamefully withdrawn from the UN Human Rights Council. Thankfully, that decision has been reversed and we don't expect it to be re-reversed, but re-engaging is not enough. The United States has to harness its partnership with the EU, other members, Japan, and um, other members of the Human Rights Council to really make sure that there is sustained pressure in Geneva. The votes on the resolutions on Sri Lanka, which are so important for maintaining pressure on accountability issues, are razor and US um, engagement is vital. As for Congress in particular, we want to be clear, Congress needs to communicate clearly, both to the Biden administration and to the government of Sri Lanka. Failures to address these issues are going to imperil current and future military to military engagements and better economic relations. Congress has powers here to restrict or condition military engagements through the Appropriations Act, through other means. Um, it has oversight over economic uh, agreements that might be made. And it should be communicating both to the administration and to the government of Sri Lanka that they are willing to utilize that power that they have um, to restrict enhanced engagement with the government of Sri Lanka unless improvements are made. This is leverage. This is the real leverage that may if exercised effectively, lead the government of Sri Lanka or parts of it to begin moving away from some of the more abusive um, conduct that it's engaged in. We're under no illusions that moral suasion, arguments about international law are not going to have much resonance with the current government, but economic pressure and the hard politics of international relations will have an impact and could be leveraged in this context. And in that respect, I would draw attention to the country's current economic crisis and presumably its growing anxieties about China's dominance over its internal affairs, its economic affairs. Um, I don't want, I would never recommend that economic problems be uh, exploited um, even to promote human rights promotion. But the facts are the facts. This is an opportunity. These are opportunities for concerned democratic countries, the United States, Japan, the European Union, the United Kingdom, to offer Sri Lanka renewed support, the government of Sri Lanka, while communicating that even more will be provided if human rights improvements are for more. Now, at the same time, the U.S. can make clear that it can't engage with human rights abusers, it can't engage with security officials credibly implicated in gross human rights abuses. The United States has no choice but to engage with President Rajapaksa himself, despite his human rights record. He's the country's first government. The U.S. must engage as a matter of necessity and diplomatic protocol, but State Department and Pentagon officials need to continue to make clear that engagement is impossible with persons and units credibly implicated in human rights abuses. And in the absence of accountability, the U.S. has no choice but to consider imposing targeted sanctions on those persons and units under the U.S. Global Magnitsky Act. I mean, the U.S. has already imposed a travel ban, not a Magnitsky ban, but uh, under law and policy, against uh, Chief of Defense Staff General Silva for his alleged responsibility for war crimes that were alluded to before. But the U.S. should also impose targeted sanctions on others in the government who are credibly linked to gross human rights abuses. And the United States should communicate that these sanctions are going to replace unless human rights improvements are seen and look for other 
um, economic inroads to those people implicated, including shell companies, um, direct relatives who were acting as straw men for their business interests. Human Rights Watch doesn't work on corruption, but there is a huge wealth of knowledge about the corruption of this regime that can be uh, utilized for sanctions uh, applicants. Um, two last things, the United States, another recommendation, really needs to ensure that members of the Sri Lankan security forces who are deployed on UN peacekeeping missions are subject to a form of independent vetting. Sri Lanka provides a very large amount of UN and vetting until now has been conducted by the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. But the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka now lacks real independence because of the 20th Amendment of the Constitution, which was alluded to before. Uh, lastly, given the inconclusive results so far of investigations into the 2019 Easter bombings, the United States really needs to push harder for a prompt, impartial, incredible, independent investigation and conclusion about the events um, and examine evidence of um, that they may be able to provide as, a, as an international actor. Um, one thing I neglected to mention, the United States and its allies could also look more closely at evidence of corruption and money laundering generally. Um, the Presidential Commission in Sri Lanka on Political Victimization has been blocking all domestic corruption investigations. I think it's very important that other financial authorities across Asia and the United States and EU try to increase their vetting um, to examine evidence of transnational corruption and money laundering. Well, thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Yes, and thank you for um, for the, the the practical solutions. I think many of our questions would have centered around those, so you anticipated our questions, and I appreciate that. Um, I am going to first um, recognize Chair Smith if he is here to ask any questions he might have, followed by Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, who has joined us, and then I will ask questions. Um, Chair McGovern has submitted some questions for the record. Um, he has another engagement at five o'clock, and so he had to leave. But Chair Smith, are you still on? Checking to see if he is. If not, um, I will recognize um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee um, from Texas uh, for any questions she might have on the panel. Congresswoman Jackson Lee, you're recognized. Thank you so very much, uh, and uh, thank you for this insightful testimony on, on Human Rights uh, Day uh, that we recognize here in the United States. Um, this is a tough, um, tough posture to be in, uh, and I, I would like to hear, I've heard a number of calls on the United States uh, in terms of the impact that the United States would have either with government uh, or um, the opposition. Uh, I would like to know, uh, and that, and and I and I welcome that thought. But I'd like to know, to what extent uh, would we be effective in dealing with these uh, serious violations, the lack of uh, democratic participation, uh, undermining democracy? How much uh, input? How much? Uh, strength, when I say that, how hard are you expecting the United States to be? And would that be in collaboration uh, with the United Nations as well? What just would be the most effective tool? We have sanctioned power. Are we at that point? Um, and so I'd be interested uh, in your thoughts on that. And I would welcome who would like to take the question. Thank you. Well, if I may thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Chair. Thank you, Congresswoman Ross. It's a pleasure to have been listening and and uh, participating uh, with you. Thank you again. If I may, since I just spoke and I did neglect to mention one aspect of the economic situation, I neglected to mention the extent to which the European Union's 
uh, export market for Sri Lanka. In other words, Sri Lanka's exports to the European Union um, are very much a leverage point right now. And it's our view that between the United States export market and the EU export market and the use of the generalized system of preferences scheme, GSP plus in the case of the European Union um, and the human rights conditionalities that are baked into those, uh, that's a huge amount of leverage that could be used and but would be most effective if the European Union and the US coordinated on executing that leverage. We don't want ordinary financial uh, commercial entities in Sri Lanka to suffer for the crimes of their government, but there are targeted forms of um, rollbacks of tariff uh, privileges that could have a huge impact on the behavior of the government. Um, anybody else want to um, share their thoughts? I, I'd like to say something on that. Just Thank you. to underscore, you know, the the process can be can be slow, um, but I, I do want to emphasize the importance of consistent messaging and pressure from the international community and and stressing those messages. And there are two in particular that I would that I would underscore. The first is sending a message that holding on to power in an effort to escape accountability is not a permanent solution. There will be calls for accountability until there is accountability. There will be demands for traditional just for I'm sorry for transitional justice in the country until there is justice in the country. Um, and and there is no office that anyone in power can aspire to that will allow them to escape that reality. That would be the first message. The second message is that the the U.S., the U.N., other governments will continue to scrutinize the domestic mechanisms and will not allow this government to use a a hollowed out, you know, purportedly justice institution to deflect attention from the international community that we expect to see independent uh, investigations into into these allegations and into war crimes. I think by underscoring the importance of those messages, it sends a, a clear a clear message to the government in power that there is no appetite on the part of the U.S. on the part of the U.N. For allowing these um, these allegations to be swept under the rug, despite the fact that justice does not always come as swiftly as we would hope. Yes, Professor. I um, oh, and then we'll go to Ambika. Yeah, yeah. To, to the professor, and then to Ambika. Right. Oh, thank you. Um, I think one of the things that we should recognize is that the uh, the Sri Lankan many figures in the Sri Lankan government are not anti-West. And they are not anti-American. Um, they crave uh, the recognition of the West, even when they have, you know, pretty close ties to some of the more authoritarian states out there. Uh, but as we, I think, all know, the U.S. position on the global stage is not what it used to be. And so, uh, I think it's important that the U.S. collaborate. Uh, it certainly does this in the military sphere. And it could do this, you know, when it comes to human rights, collaborate closer with uh, Australia, the UK, the EU countries, Japan, and even India, and and uh, try to put pressure on the Sri Lankan government as some kind of, you know, a coordinated agreement among them. Um, and when it comes to the Muslims in the country, uh, I think, you know, working with uh, predominantly Muslim countries, Middle Eastern countries, that Sri Lanka depends on enormously for remittances. Um, and, and, and getting those countries to speak out, and it's been quite disappointing uh, how so many of those countries just kept quiet when the Muslim community was attacked on a number of occasions. So the, the, the U.S. brings enormous power on the one hand, uh, continues to be the most attractive country uh, for Sri Lankans, and so there are so many ways in which to leverage this particular issue. And of course, there are sanctions and the like uh, that also can be applied uh, on individuals. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, although uh, they will and they have in the past, the regime has exploited uh, uh, you know, interstate rivalries, particularly with China, uh, they do crave the validation of the West. 
act, and we have seen this repeatedly in their behavior. Um, in terms of using leverage, I think it's also important to ensure that the regime knows that you support uh, vulnerable communities such as human rights defenders, uh, communities in the north and the east, families of the disappeared. Um, and in terms of sanctions, uh, um, as I said uh, before, the Magnitsky Act and also public designation measures via Section uh, 7031C of the Department of State Foreign Operations and Related Programs Appropriation Act. And I think most importantly to ensure that um, U.S. funding uh, does not even unwittingly support efforts that further erode human rights. So, for instance, um, counterterrorism support, uh, support for programs on countering violent extremism, all of which have been illustrated or, you know, proven all over the world to be used by authoritarian states to further under undermine human rights. Uh, I think the United States has a lot of leverage. And I think you should not underestimate uh, the power that you have in terms of uh, the regime. Thank you all very much. Uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, do you have any additional questions for the panel? I do. Um, we have watched the ups and downs of Myanmar uh, with the now incarceration of uh, their leader that was on house arrest, then at, what seemed to be a new day elected and now arrested again. Do we have the, what, what is the uh, mindset of the uh, government and violations of human rights groups and, and democracy of doing that, arresting and holding numbers of political prisoners, including some of the most prominent opposition in Sri Lanka? Would that be a tactic that they would use? I'm sorry if I did not, uh, I think the connection was bad, the first bit. I just missed if you do not uh, mind, uh, Congresswoman Lee, was it possible to repeat that? I'd be happy to, I'm sorry. Let's see, can you hear me any better? Yes, yes. Or, um, Myanmar, Burma, has seen uh, their esteemed leader first be under house arrest, then be, um, vindicated, relieved, leave the government, and now arrested again. You mentioned how uh, important it is for us as the American government to emphasize our lack of tolerance for violations uh, and acts against human rights activists and other opposition. Is the government at a point where they will round up people and arrest them, create political prisons, take in opposition leaders, uh, and do as has been done in Burma, which has been just a roller coaster of inconsistency. Is that what may happen? And therefore, not functioning on governing, not functioning on impoverished people, but really function on holding power. Um, thank you for the question. Very pertinent. Um, what we have seen is that the government has weaponized law all the while that it um, disregards the law, it breaks the law and abuses the law. It has also weaponized it, and we have seen the use of the Prevention of Terrorism Act and also the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights Act being used to arrest, arrest and detain people, um, also most often without bail, because these two laws also do not uh, allow bail. Uh, of um, ethnic, um, you know, ethnic groups, people who have memorialized, uh, uh, journalists have been summoned uh, uh, under these laws for interrogation. Civil society groups, uh, particularly those from the north and the east, are constantly uh, summoned for interrogation, receive visits from intelligence, all within the rubric of these laws. Um, so, and also we have seen in recent times protested because of the economic conditions, there have been a lot of protests. Uh, we have seen the protesters, including in the South, uh, uh, being arrested, some being remanded for several weeks without being given bail. So I think the law being weaponized and instrumentalized is something that this regime has been doing. Uh, 
And since it has very strong authoritarian tendencies and refuses to be held accountable, as the economic condition deteriorates and we see a lot of a uh, lot more protests and uh, social upheaval and um, uh, insecurities, there's really, um, we cannot predict how the state will use it, but there is definitely given their past action during the previous time they were in power and the deterioration for the respect of the rule of law and democracy that we have seen since they uh, were elected to power, I think that is a very legitimate concern. May I add to it? Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. So I, I can add to a couple of examples. One is the recent arrest of two Muslim politicians who have been in the front line, particularly Asad Sali, who, have, who has been in the front line with regard to cremation of Muslim COVID impacted bodies. Uh, he has been taken under uh, ICC, I mean, he was first arrested under ICCPR, then PTA, various other law, uh, you know, laws and sections have been used to detain. He has been released when the president was traveling to Middle Eastern country, probably on the promise of getting some um, assistance from Middle Eastern countries. And then uh, another political leader is Rishad Badruddin, who has been arrested and detained. Uh, he's elected member and a political party leader also. Another person I could talk about it from the opposition is um, a, a very young um, opposition politician, uh, Iran, uh, sorry, Harin. Harin has been talking about a lot about accountability with regard to Easter attack. He comes from a, a Catholic community and he has been in the front line exposing Sri Lankan government negligence, also connection of a, a particular high-ranking officer uh, uh, in the country who, uh, who has been mentioned in various reports. Um, about, you know, 50 odd uh, officers went into his house after he making a you know, presentation with regard to particular evidence that he was unnerving. So they, they, there was a huge intimidation and he has been silent. So many opposition uh, politicians, when they want to talk about it, um, there is intimidation, there has been arrest also. Very interestingly, under the previous regime, the Buddhist monks went on to hunger strike in order for the two Muslim politicians that I talked about it to resign from their position. Thus, all the Muslim politicians in the previous government who were state ministers, um, uh, the ministers uh, resigned from their position. So there is cohesion, not only by like by mere law, but also uh, the extremist monks and the various way that they intimidate, uh, bringing in various apparatus, uh, you know, like the uh, surveillance and all those things. And, and, and that's also happening. Thank you. I just thank you very much on that. Um, and first of all, I'm so sorry to Shreen Saror to be up at 3.30 in the morning. Yeah. You're much more elic, elic, articulate than I would be at 3.30 in the morning. I just wanted to emphasize that, that it's clear this government is not shameable. They are not capable of being shamed in the better behavior. They will be incentivized or motivated by their risk profile. And that is primarily at this point, their political and economic risk profile. The economic crisis, the balance of payments crisis, their massive shortages in foreign currency reserves are one risk, a risk that will become a political risk as they are unable to deliver to the people of Sri Lanka. It's a question of the United States and the EU figuring out a moral, or ethical way to leverage that risk that they're up against that doesn't punish the people of Sri Lanka, but incentivizes the government to recognize that they need to start making concessions on human rights issues. That's the subject that we're up against right here. And that's why I suggest coordinating closely with the United, um, sorry, with the European Union to figure out ways to communicate exactly what the benchmarks are and what economic assistance will be available if Sri Lanka does certain things. Action for action, more for more, less for less. If I may Thank you. The professor, the, yes. Uh, 
in response to uh, Representative uh, Jackson Lee's uh, question, uh, one of the things that has been broached recently uh, as a threat, I suppose, is to uh, yank away the civic rights of certain politicians in the opposition. And what that would mean is then that they would not be able to run for office. So this is uh, a threat that you know has been um, has been brought up from time to time, uh, pointing to an instance in the 70s uh, when the former prime minister of the uh, Sri Lanka Freedom Party uh, had her civic rights uh, taken away. Uh, something else that I think we should also keep in uh, pay close attention to is the draft constitution that the Rajapaksa government has promised to come up with before the end of the year. And uh, knowing this particular government, uh, in light of the 18th Amendment that Mahindra Rajapaksa passed and the 20th Amendment, which Gotabaya Rajapaksa got through parliament, I really can't see this new document that they are supposedly you know, working on. And there's been absolutely no input provided by outside entities. This seems to be something that's being hatched in secret and they may try to ram it through uh, the country uh, in order to you know, uh, get it passed. But I think Congress and, and all the human rights organizations and all of us who care about Sri Lanka should pay very, very close attention to what this document is going to look like. Okay. Does anybody else want to address this question before we close this question out? If I could say one, one thing quickly about the, the comparison to Burma, I think one of the things that stands out to me is looking at how the evolution of the, the military in, in Burma played out um, and what that means about impunity and what that what that implies in this situation. You know, before you saw the coup, you saw the, the violence against the Rohingya committed during this apparently democratic transition and a real failure to respond in a significant way to that on the part of the international community. And, and the, the signal to the military that impunity was an option was a, a critical failure and played directly into what we then saw happening with the coup and, and what we continue to see happening with these human rights violations. And that's something that I do think it's wise to consider when we look at what's happening here. You know, you saw for, for a period of time um, that the Tamil minority was really the focus of so many of these human rights violations. And, and it shifted somewhat to the Muslim population um, when there was a, a, an oppor a political opportunity, but that's grounded in an expectation of impunity, an expectation that there will not be accountability. Um, and so in that sense, I think you're absolutely right to think that there is a risk, certainly, that once again, if that, if that continues, if that pattern continues, there can once again be a shift to target political oppositions. And we're already seeing, as been, has been mentioned by the panelists, panelists a closing of, of civil society space and limits on freedom of expression that I think um, really portends some of those things that you've raised. And, and, quickly, and there was one more person who had wanted to speak. Yes, uh, and quickly, uh, Building on what Carolyn said, just very quickly, I think the historical and even ethno-nationalist, ethno-religious uh, similarities in many ways between Myanmar and Sri Lanka are extremely, extremely important to recognize, uh, down to one, both countries being uh, kind of hubs of uh, extreme Buddhism, two of the only countries that practice Theravada Buddhism, uh, and being so-called kind of majorities with a minority complex um, is usually the term. And even down to, if you look at what spurred this, the kind of the newest resurgence of the Rohingya uh, crisis in 2016, where the genocide there was spurred by a small scale attack on a, I think it was a police station of some sort at the border. In 1983, the really what's considered the start of the Sri Lankan civil war, Black July, um, where you had a very small attack on a Sinhalese police station that in response over the course of, you know, just several days, a week, two weeks, led to 
thousands of Tamil deaths from Sinhalese mobs and the forced displacement of you know, at least 150,000 Tamils. Um, and I think so when we're looking at kind of now what the similar similarities are in present day, that's just a very important to keep in mind. Thank well, you thank very you, much. Yeah, thank you to all of you. Um, Representative Jackson Lee, do you mind if I ask a couple questions that um, Chair McGovern had left um, that he would like to hear from the um, the witnesses, or do you have do you have another question that you need to ask right now? Absolutely not. I look forward to your questioning, and thank you so very much for your generosity. Thank oh, you. To the thank you. Excellent Great. questions, and thank you for supporting this. Um, uh, this question is for Shreen, um, and this is from Chairman McGovern. Um, can you describe the peace building work you're doing with Muslim and Tamil women and how have the current current government's policies affected your efforts to promote peace building and reconciliation across ethnic differences um, with the female population? A uh, bit tough, uh, very difficult to talk about. Women's Action Network brought in uh, all mostly all the northeast uh, places where the Muslims and uh, Tamils coexisted for a very long time, particularly looking to women's issues um, on in the post-war context. Also, the current uh, the the issues related to re religiosity and and the attacks on the minority religion. Um, very interestingly, I, I can talk about one good example, but I, I also want to say one thing that tomorrow um, I'm in the Eastern province. We are we Muslim and Tamil women are going to march uh, asking for repeal of Prevention of Terrorism Act. While asking for that, we are also asking for discriminatory laws to be reformed that involve Muslim personal law as well. Um, the work that we have been doing uh, in connection with rebuilding uh, communities, affected communities, has come to a pretty much closure with regard to transitional justice issues, accountability issues and all. Um, when Women's Action Network came under scrutiny, therefore we had to close everything. Uh, only thing that we could do uh, is educating people on reparation that's limited to compensation, which we refused to do. Uh, much of a small memorial spaces that we have been created also need to be closed down because military has been visiting places where women would come together to mourn for their losses that also not allowed more recently uh, you know now november is the month we we talk about people who died um, of of war and many of us didn't do usual thing we we were restricted our homes uh, lighting a candle or oil lamp. Um, so therefore gathering has become hugely challenging. And also I want to leave you with one example, uh, Muslim personal law. This was a 40 years of Muslim women's um, struggle to reform the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, which is archaic, which has been not touched by the Sri Lankan state because uh, the patronage politics that the Sri Lankan Muslims did um, therefore, it allows child marriage. There is no women anywhere in the system, the structure, the, 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 the judiciary structure. Um, poly, uh, unconditional polygamy, no registration of marriage. So this was oppressing women a lot. When uh, with Tamil and Muslim women work very hard, uh, bringing women to testify in parliament and various other, other uh, forums previously. Thus, there have been a draft uh, uh, you know proposals and currently we have a bill which meets the demand of the muslim women but we have come to a, a point where we women tomorrow have to say in a hold up your card don't repeal the mmda but reform it because under the one country one law this very mong jnana sara want to take away the MMDA, Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act. Sri Lanka is a multi-religious, multi-cultural you know, cultural country, and we want these laws, whether it's Tesavalame for Tamil, uh, Tamil community or 
the MMDA, for the Muslim community, and for the Kandian co community, there is a Kandian law. We wanted it to be reformed to be par with the fundamental rights chapter of the Constitution so that women and children are treated equally. But we have come to a point because of the anti Muslim rhetoric, we needed to defend this law that the very law we have been asking to reform. So I'll leave it with that. That's the space that we have uh, with regard to reforming policies. Thank you. Thank you and best of luck to you with your demonstration. Um, you're you're um, holding a torch for women around the world. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then um, I think we will try to wrap this up because we're anticipating having votes called in just a few minutes. Um, but I, I cannot thank the entire panel enough for your time for uh, your courage and for making sure that um, Congress knows not just about the plight of uh, the people of Sri Lanka and the people and the Sri Lankan diaspora here, but um, thank you so much for already giving us so many concrete ideas about how we can be helpful to you. Um, my, my question comes some from the fact that I talk to so many families um, who have suffered. And so this question is for anybody who, who might be willing to help. The UN Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances reported that Sri Lanka holds the second largest number of unsolved enforced disappearance cases in the world. What can the international community do to help the families of the disappeared find answers. Um, and I, I'd like to hear from as many of you as might have some um, ideas for what we can do to provide resources to these families. Um, shall I go first? Yes, okay. Um, I think, uh, firstly, uh, the families that disappeared, uh, particularly since this regime came into power, they have been uh, subject to surveillance. That never stopped even during the previous government, but it has been stepped up. So surveillance, harassment, intimidation, most of these groups are made up of mainly women. So they are particularly vulnerable to this. They also live alone. You have the, the intelligence agencies visiting their home, for you know, uh, interrogation, questioning them, phoning them. A particular woman I had met uh, said that you know, in two months, I think it was in a month and a half, she'd received about six such summons and people had turned up at her house. So the first thing I think is for the US government to insist on their right to protest, their right to, her, to be heard, and their demands for the truth to ensure their security. I think that is integral. The other is to uh, um, openly support them and to continue calling for accountability and particularly also for truth. The third is to support civil society organizations that, are, that work with these families who are also under threat and who are being summoned to be questioned, you know, asking, being asked for information about the work they do. Um, and that is not only through provision of you know, financial assistance, but also, as I said, uh, through verbal pronouncements and through engagement with the government on this. And the fourth thing I think is to also support the UN processes related to this, which would then be the accountability mechanism, uh, the ev sorry, the evidence gathering mechanism established uh, at the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and also uh, the recommendations made by bodies such as the UN Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances. Thank you. Wonderful. Does anybody else have anything to add? I just want to add to what Ambika said. Uh, accompaniment, uh, particularly in relation to cases, uh, because of the pandemic, many of the habeas corpus cases that they have been filed um, are getting kind of stagnated. Many of these women have petitioned or ask Shavindra Silva, the current army commander, as the person who would have been in charge of you know, people who surrendered. So the international visibility has to come in the form of accompaniment. Every time the case is heard, um, US official, you know, like the di diplomatic mission officials could go collectively. Uh, that's very important. The other thing is um, 
um, you know, there is open talk about Office of Missing Person and the reparation. Now, what the women ask is the justice pillar. They wanted the accountability pillar first. And the, the government, the previous government, because the, 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 the OMP and the reparations are the easiest one, they went with it. And therefore, one need to be very mindful because the mothers, many mothers did not, did not engage with Office of Missing Person. So continuum of that office of missing person is also a problem because whether the mothers want to engage or not, that also some, you know, we need to consider. Thank you very much. I'm gonna ask my final question because we just got our um, vote notice about um, the vote coming up, um, but we may submit some more questions for the record. So we're not done with you yet. Um, but this question, um, is really a question that goes to war crimes that have gone on over time um, and um, occur in other countries as well. But the crimes that we've been we've heard about, they're current crimes, of course, but many of them are crimes that uh, occurred over a decade ago. And um, how are potential legal avenues for redress affected by the passage of time? And do they simply forego? means of redress. We've talked a little bit about reparations and things like that, but um, what is the best way to pursue this redress and how can the international community be of assistance? And again, I'll open this up to anybody who um, wants to answer. Uh, if I may. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, from, a, from a legal perspective, um, di Enforced disappearances are obviously a special form of abuse that uh, many legal jurisdictions recognize as an ongoing crime. In other words, the disappearance it does not set the clock tolling. The, the clock tolls every moment that the disappeared are not accounted for. Um, this is important from a legal perspective. I would raise it in the U.S. context in the context of consideration about global Magnitsky sanctions. As you are probably aware and other panelists are aware and viewers are aware, current US policy about the imposition of global Magnitsky sanctions specify that the, that the sanctions need to be imposed for abuses that have occurred recently, although it's not exactly defined what that means, and uh, will impact ongoing behavior. This is a way of saying basically the United States does not want to use global Magnitsky sanctions to reach into the deep past and deal with human rights abuses that occurred a long time ago. We disagree about that policy, but that's what it is. In this context, we would urge members of Congress to press the administration and subsequent administrations and lawyers in the executive branch to have a broad interpretation of global Magnitsky where they see that ongoing enforced disappearances are a current human rights abuse. These are not things that happened in 2009, although they began in 2009. These are crimes which are occurring every day that families don't know where their relatives are. These are crimes that are ongoing. If you adopt that trend, if you adopt that interpretation, you will allow the global Magnitsky sanction regime to be imposed in a more inclusive way. You also recognize that some of the policymakers in question are still in power. We understand that the US Treasury Department is reluctant to wield Treasury authority under global Magnitsky unless they have a reasonable theory of change a reasonable idea that the sanction will impact current government behavior? Well, that's easy enough because of the people we're recommending who are implicated in enforced disappearances are still in power and they still have the capacity to engage in future abuses. It's just a question of looking at those past crimes as ongoing crimes. Okay. Um, we just heard the bell, so I want to give the opportunity um, if anybody wants to add to this um, briefly. And I don't want to cut people off, but I have to close the hearing for the vote. So um, are there other people who have some ideas about the, about how we can um, deal with past crimes, not just disappearances? 
And yes, if I could just say very really. briefly, um, the, transitional justice is is not optional, no matter what the context is, and but it doesn't always look the same. So you have sometimes UN mechanisms. You also can have domestic institutions where those are functioning. You can also have community led mechanisms for that. And so I do think the international community being creative about how you approach traditional justice and making sure that they are available to the, the full menu of options is part of that. But I want to leave time for other people as well. So I'll stop yes. there. And Are there others? Yes, uh, I would just like to say in terms at least of uh, inter legal international accountability mechanisms, uh, first off, uh, there is a reason that at least under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and a lot of customary international law, there is no statute of limitations that comes with atrocity crimes, meaning war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. That is a, a very purposeful thing, given that these are crimes that shock the conscience. Um, while Obviously, when perpetrators die, so to do trials, at the same time, meaningful justice processes, or at least in terms of trials and prosecutions, often take time. Uh, you have people in, or even German prosecutors at the moment who have just initiated uh, a prosecution against a in Iranian war criminal for crimes that occurred over three decades ago. Uh, in Chile, you had Augusto Pinochet, who was not uh, arrested in the United Kingdom until 2000. He had ascended to power in 1973. Um, and no, in fact, if anything, I mean, 10 years is too long, but in no, no way forecloses sorry, my light in no way forecloses legal accountability mechanisms. Okay. Um, any Anybody else want to add and then um, I will close things out. Well, again, I cannot thank you enough. We cannot thank you enough. Um, all of this information will be shared, will be part of the record, will be shared with members of um, Congress and others. Um, and I just, especially those who have been up for two or three hours in the middle of the night, I hope you can get back to bed and get a good night's sleep. But thank you so, so much for being with us um, and providing this testimony. We may provide additional questions to you from the members who had to leave a little early. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.